so he's been doing well on this series. Actually traveled out from the Invitational this weekend, and while he did not have success in that particular tournament, he's certainly having success today in the standard portion and looking to keep it going against Michael and his nine mid-range deck. Now, one of the things about Michael's deck, Michael's deck harkens back to a moment when uh, Black-Red Aggro was the kind of one of the default expected decks. And so Huntmaster, Thrag Tusk, Restoration Angel, those were all part of what you would be doing to resist it. He also has Centaur Healer. As we are going to see a Strongkirk Noble here from Ian coming on through Evans Pilgrim as it is a human and Strongkirk Noble cannot be blocked by those. It is going to be pretty important for Ian, of course, to build that Stromkirk Noble up as fast as he can, get it out of Burn Rage, hopefully get it out of the range of a Centaur Healer, and we are going to see another one here. As Michael is just going to pass back Avacyn's Pilgrim, he does play a Mountain. And now he's deciding, as we do see an Angel of Serenity there, he does have that White Source of Mana through the Pilgrim. Don't see a Centaur Healer just yet. I do see a Bonfire of the Dam being pushed forward, however. And that's a bit scary, always, because it is Bonfire of the Damned. Ah, uh, the little vampires. One. To you. One vampire dies. Ian Kendall takes one. The other vampire lives. And it is growing quickly as we see Ian untap. He takes his one. He loses his strong quick noble, but he has another one. Falkmire Thriftscraft, the draw for the turn. No haste creature or exalted creature here for Ian. So it is only going to make it a 3-3. Three, three. And now the question is, does he have the land? He does. And we are going to see Boom. the aforementioned Hellhole Flare, a card that you guys don't see very often. So we'll bring it up for you guys. One of the better uncommons when you're drafting Return to Ravnica. You don't see it a lot in Constructed, but based off this performance, we might start. Now, Michael Marinan, four mana open. Does he have a Restoration Angel? Is Ian Kendall willing to find out with his Vampire? The Hellhole Flailer represents a potential for a lot of damage. Right now, um, it's a 4-3, so should he choose to use four mana at some point later in the game, he could use however much power it has to go straight to the face of Michael Marinan. You know, it's kind of an interesting card. Not only is it a great attacker, but it does have that useful ability as well to deal those last extra points of damage as we do see Vampire named here with Cavern Souls to allow Falconrath Aristocrat as Ian is crashing in with two four-power creatures. So if Michael does opt to play a Restoration Angel, it will be trading at best, but we see Avacyn's Pilgrim jumping in front, Restoration Angel blinking the Avacyn's Pilgrim, and it looks as though Michael will be taking at least four as Ian did make the correct read on holding back his Stromkirk Noble for now. Yeah. A land that gives him uh, action here with Thrag Tusk if he wants it. Thrag Tusk is a pretty good play. Thrag Tusk in his hand looking to, you know, shore up things on the ground, make things a little bit more difficult for Hellhole Flare and Stromkirk Noble. But again, Falconrath Aristocrat, one of the reasons is it is one of the best cards in the format. Flying. Going right over the top of Thragtus, it's going to have to work its way through that Restoration Angel, but it doesn't look like it's going to be much of a problem doing that. Michael Marinan trying to see if there's any other options. He goes with the Thragtus plan. Five more life. A defender in the air, a defender on the ground, but that Aristocrat, this is one of the reasons to play black in your red base deck. Both you and I have been uh, championing this at various different points, and, you know, I know I love it, so... Right now, Ian Kendall taking advantage of Aristocrat. And we're going to see a Blood Crypt here, and I think we're going to see the second Aristocrat in Ian's hand as he does tap four mana, and he Boom. is going to play that second one. And we're likely going to see service in the air here. Aristocrats both coming in. We'll see if Michael decides to throw Restoration Angel in the way, which will basically be a removal spell for one of the other two creatures, likely the Stromkirk Noble. Yep. That Strongkirk Noble as a 3-3 has managed to deal three damage this tournament. That is, in fact, the most damage I've seen a Noble deal all tournament. <laughs> we did see a match earlier where um, someone was able to get it up to a 4-4. But again, it's not its not that it's, it's, it's a bad card or anything. It's just not really well placed in the format right now. There just aren't a lot of humans running around. Yeah. Patrick and I were talking about other one-drops that you could run if you don't like the Noble. Patrick and I don't like the Noble. Um, Reckless Waif and Stone Right both in our experience, do more damage than a Noble does right now. So if you're a red-based player out there and you're looking for options, consider those as ideas. 
as we are going to see Restoration Angel move in front of, move in front here. Stromkirk Noble gonna bite the dust. It's damage already done. Now it's saving Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Falcon, the other one deals four. It's gonna knock Michael down to 14, and it looks like Ian's gonna throw the turn Michael's way and say, "Do your worst." One of the cards that uh, we see in this list is Rakdos Cackler times four. It's so not a surprising thing. We saw four of them in many of the zombies lists. Seeing them in the red list here makes sense. Thragtusk comes on in, trying to present a race here to Ian Kendall. And with Hellhole Flare being unleashed, does not have the ability to block. We're going to see a Kessick Wolf run here. We see Angel of Serenity in Michael's hand, and he does, one, not have enough mana to cast it, of course, because it does cost seven. But Adrian, it's also triple white, and he only has two white now because of Sun Petal Grove and Avacyn's Pilgrim. And down comes the Huntmaster, two life and a wolf. Daring Ian Kendall to cast a card, lest the Huntmaster become a Ravager. And we do see Ian draw another Knight of Infamy. A very good draw step there for multiple reasons, of course, but most importantly, it's going to do a nice job of protecting those Falconrath Aristocrats while also bolstering them. In the air for eight. No defense in the air for Michael Marinan. That drops him down to eight. He's really going to need that third white source very, very badly. Ian considering whether to lay a creature or not. He does. And there's both of them. Now, with this, he's got a Hellhole Flailer, which can sacrifice for four damage. He's got two vampires, which at least can do four damage each. Because there are two humans back that can block, he has the ability to turn his uh, vampires into five twos should he need to. This is a pretty p um, powerful position, and Michael Marinan needs something very powerful right now. He has an Angel of Serenity in hand, but without some help. One more white mana, will that do it? The third white mana would do it, but the draw step for Michael, unfortunately, was not that. At least not now. His draw step was a far seed. So now he has to ask himself the question, what can I do to make it through this turn? And I'm not quite sure what it's going to be. The other card in hand, Angel of Serenity, which you've mentioned, the Far Seek, which was his draw. Michael Marinan, considering what happens if the Huntmaster of the Fells flips? It doesn't really look to be too much. I mean, if he does choose to try to take out that Falconrath Aristocrat, Ian will just use its ability, sacrifice something, most likely one of those Knight of Infamies to take care of things, but this looks like kind of a last-ditch effort on this attack. Maybe Ian makes some sort of an error, which, you know, these things can't happen. You have to play to your outs the best you can. So we see Michael reaching for his creatures, considering the ramifications of an attack here. Ian's no fool. Uh, I mean, he knows with this flailer, with his aristocrat, with his aristocrat, there's going to need to be a pretty potent combination of cards for Michael Marinan to survive this turn. And uh, Michael decides not even to try to test him on it. But I think what you're at when you're Michael and in that position is trying to figure out what you can represent. Because you have to actually actively represent something that is going to make Ian not come in, which... Even if you're representing it, you still want to call that bluff. Yeah, it is a difficult situation there. Even the things that he can potentially try to represent there, it's just, you know, a really, really bad spot for him. And he just decided, you know, I'm just going to move on. I really yeah. can't win this game. Let's, let's use my mental energy somewhere else. So completely understandable. Yeah. For the first time this weekend, we're doing something we do at every Star City Games Open Series event. We're giving away some free prizes to everyone, well not everyone, to one lucky person out there. <laughs> everyone out there has an opportunity to win it. That is true. Yes, it is the trivia giveaway. How this works, it's pretty simple. Cedric here has a clever trivia question. If you can guess the correct answer, and with the hashtag SCG Premium, answer the trivia question correctly. Yeah. In the quarterfinals, you will get three free months of Star City Games Premium. That's now, correct. Now, you need to make sure you use that hashtag. You can see it right there below the SCG Live, right in the center. SCG Premium, that's the hashtag you're going to want to use. And one lucky person who successfully guesses the correct answer to Cedric Phillips' trivia question will get three free months of Star City Games Premium. And it is a toughie 
Uh oh. For those of you who were not paying attention, it would be difficult. For, for those mm. of you who were, it should be an easy one for you. A little softball, a little lob for you guys. In Ian Kendall's take on red black aggro, he is playing a three drop that is not often seen in constructed. The three drop slot in this deck, again, has been very highly contested between um, Pyreheart Wolf, between Rakdos Kirun, and between this card. If you're able to name that card that he has three copies of in his main deck, one that we may have seen last game, submit that answer over to hashtag SCGPremium, and the, we will select a winner, and that winner will win three months of premium. Yeah, now, three months of premium, for my money, if you're going to get it for free, well, that's pretty awesome. Agreed. But even if you're not getting it for free, the amount of content you get week after week after week it's just awesome. If you care about tournament magic, you should be reading SCG Premium. Absolutely agree. With all the videos that are being produced above, around, below, beneath the curve. No, I kid. Uh, I mean, that great show that Glenn, that Glenn, uh, Jerry, and Brad are making right now. And just the premium content that's written by Patrick Chapin, Brian Kibler, yep. and just the great writers on Star City Games Premium. Winning it is obviously fantastic. Absolutely. But as Adrian said, if you are playing tournament magic and care about tournament magic, it's the place to be. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things about it these days, you've got to get all the information you can. It doesn't matter if you think that the person who wrote the article is wrong. Somebody else might not think they're wrong. And when you're playing them, if you've been reading, you can maybe peg them for exactly what they've got in their hands. That's correct. Information is key, especially in this game. So we're going to cut back to the match here as we see both players sideboarding here. Ian Kendall on the right up a game against Michael Marinan, I Michael believe. Michael Marinan, thank you. I do. I did not want to pronounce his name wrong because I hate when people do it for my name. <laughs> but C Cedric? Yeah, that hurts. That's, that's like nails on a chalkboard <laughs> for me. But we see I have Michael's deck list in front of me. He is down a game here. Unfortunately, game one, he was not able to peel that third white source for what would have been a back-breaking Angel Serenity. But we, what we do see in the sideboard of his deck is you're going to see two copies of Oblivion Ring, which will be likely very useful here. Two copies of Pillar Flame, which are almost certainly going to come in. Four copies of Loxon Smire, the old three mana 4-4, four, four, which does a nice job of brick walling a lot of cards in Ian's red-black aggro deck. Two Cigar Host of Herons, which is a five mana 5-5 five, five flyer, which may not seem so great because it seems like a little bit slow, but that's the kind of card that really gets in the way of the card that really did Michael in in Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. And then, of course, you see two Rest in Peace and one Acidic Slime, which this is not really the home for those two cards. Now, remember, you can see Ian Kendall there looking down. What he's looking at is the deck list, so he gets to see all of the possible things that Michael Marinan might bring in. And conversely, Michael Marinan can do the same thing to Ian Kendall. So there's kind of a a little bit of jostling you can do, like, oh, if he's going to bring in uh, perhaps Flames of the Firebrand, maybe I'll sideboard out this. Mm -hmm. But you can't go too far down that rabbit hole, or you could just trick yourself out of some simple, obvious, powerful plays. I think one of the things that we are very, very likely to see, Zealous Conscripts, is one of the easy go-tos here for Ian Kendall. You lay a Thrag Tusk, but you're still pretty low. Let me take it, come in for at least eight, plus maybe whatever else I've got. That's an easy one. The rest of it starts getting into the point where you're jostling. I personally really like Appetite for Brains. You can stop Angel of Serenity, you can stop Thrag Tusk, you can stop Huntmaster of the Fells, all of which are cards you don't really want to see, and it's a cheap, cheap price of a single black mana. After that, now you're getting into some games. Do you want to have Flames of the Firebrand to maybe take out a Huntmaster and an Avacyn's Pilgrim? Maybe. Or maybe it's just a little too slow for you. You know, do you want to have ultimate price to take out an Angel of Serenity in the air? Well, maybe it's already done its damage then. Personally, I would probably stop right at Appetite for Brains and Zealous Conscripts, although I think the best arguments beyond that is maybe a little bit for Flames of the Firebrand. Maybe one Slaughter Games just to say Angel of Serenity so the long game doesn't go crazy. Yeah, I mean, you can also have an argument there for naming Thragtos with Slaughter Games as well and just getting that little sub-game out of the way. You know, and, and even another card that, it, interestingly enough, is, is something under consideration here is Vampire Nighthawk, just because with the way that Michael Zek can gum up the ground with Thrag Tusk and Huntmaster of the Fells, and of course Centaur Healer, we saw how good flying can be with Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, and though Vampire Nighthawk doesn't hit as hard, it is still a flyer, and that life gain is certainly not irrelevant. Yeah. You know, these games can certainly come down to racing situations. One of the questions you really want to ask yourself, how much do you want to fight against Avacyn's Pilgrim? Now, Avacyn's Pilgrim, like any bird of paradise or elf, functions like a mini little tiny time walk. But if you try to fight against those kinds of cards, as the game progresses to a later stage in the game, your cards, like Pillar of Flame, start to look much more uh, silly and, and weak as the big guns come out, when you start seeing Restoration Angels, you start seeing Thrag Tusks. And that's usually a question that is best suited by 
how much experience you have in a particular matchup. In this one, I still like making sure I have a card like Searing Spear. You've got these Centaur Healers that you've got to deal with. Get it out of the way, slam on in. The Pillar of Flames, I'm a, I'm a little questioning on four after board, but those Stromkirk Nobles, those would go for me. There's a Stromkirk Noble. I, I don't know that I'd have that in myself, but... Hey, speak of the devil and he shall appear. As we do see Stromkirk Noble and the aforementioned Avacyn's Pilgrim, so these are good starts for both players here. So we see Michael play a Rootbound Crag as well, considering his options here for turn two. Uh, we see an Oblivion Ring here, and that is actually going to take care of the Stromkirk Noble right away. So it's yep. going to take care of one of Ian's lesser threats, but it will give Michael the necessary time to get himself yeah. set up. All he's looking for is the time and the mana, so that when the mid-game starts he's at a high enough life total that a card like Zealous Conscripts doesn't just say, you die. Now, Ian is looking at over his hand. We have two Cavern Souls. We also do have a Searing Spear there. What's interesting right now is I think he's considering, do I want to either A, play a Cavern of Souls and an Ash Shelton and, and, you know, start the beatdowns, or B, kind of take out that Avacyn Pilgrim. Slow Michael's development. Maybe cut him off of white mana if he doesn't have another white mana source. We saw that be a problem for him in game one where he didn't have the necessary white mana to cast Angel of Serenity. As we are going to see a Cavern of Souls here and we'll get confirmation on the name. Adrian, if you had a choice, what route would you take? Gosh, I mean, wait one second. Ash sell it in play. Attack for two. <sighs> Gosh, okay, that is naming human. Apologies. We, uh... Going back, I apologize. We're gonna go. I'm gonna keep going with the the game in progress. Um, we've got an angel, uh, sorry, a restoration angel in hand. Michael Marinan thinking about the Cavern of Souls here, naming Angel, maybe. Yeah, likely to name Angel yeah. here. And a pass. It is uh, Angel, or as our director is calling it, Agnel. <laughs> Searing spear there. In with the Ash Sellet. Block. Okay. No reason to do anything at this point once the block is declared, so Ian says pass, and Michael Marinan comes with a Restoration Angel to try to save his, uh, um, his Pilgrim. Searing Spear to take care of that. As we do see a Dragon Skull Summit here from Ian and just passing the turn back. So while there is a 3-4 in play, at least Ian kind of mitigated some of the damage there from the Restoration Angel being able to take care of that Avacyn's Pilgrim. It does look like Ian is, or excuse me, Michael is doing just fine on white mana. And he is coming across with the Restoration Angel now as well, representing another one here by passing with four mana available. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat uh, hanging out in the hand. One of our first games in and from elsewhere, Human Reanimator, um, well, pardon, yeah, Human Reanimator wins game one versus uh, with Corey Paxton versus Sam Kikes with four-color midrange. We'll let you know as we find out more. And there it is, Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, marching on in to see if an angel's there waiting in uh, the clouds. Picture a vampire flying through the sky. As we do see, Michael just opt to take the four damage there. Of course, Ian does have the Ash Salt that he could sacrifice to the Falcon Rathor Strat if Restoration Needle did jump in the way. It would also give a plus one, plus one counter, but it looks like Michael is just on the aggressive here as he's coming in with both of these. Now we do see a Loxon Smiter post-combat, so a lot of power on the board for Michael, and we are definitely in a racing situation, and that racing situation lends a card like Zell's Conscripts to be very, very good right now if Ian is able to fire it off, but we see that he does not have the fifth mana for the one copy that he does have in his hand. The thieving ability of these... Uh... These, oh, pardon me, the sacrificing ability of aristocrats is so powerful that we've even seen decks that completely focus their removal on being steal and then sacrifice. One more mana and Ian can pretend to be that deck for a second. Double angel versus double vampire? Oof. Ian going through the permutation tier, you do see that another Falcon Wrath Aristocrat in his hand. You also see that Zealous Conscripts and a couple other red cards that we can't make out very well, but one of them looks to be in Ash Zealot. And he's deciding exactly what he wants to do as we do see another Falcon Wrath Aristocrat here. Now he can come in for eight, which means that if Michael Marinan has a removal spell for that Ash Zealot, the game will be over and he will die. But uh, 
should he not, Michael Marinan at a very low four life. Four life period, but I mean, Thrag Tusk bring it up to nine, still rough in the uh, in the race. And we're gonna see as he's reaching for those angels and that smiter. It looks like we're gonna be getting in here. That fifth land for Michael, pretty crucial as you see him thumbing through at least one Thrag Tusk. I think that is just a pair of Thrag Tusk in his hand as we're gonna see what I believe to be Ash Sullet jumping in the way of something here. Yep. If you're just joining us, I'm Adrian Sullivan here with Cedric Phillips. We're in the booth watching the uh, quarterfinal match between Ian Kendall and Michael Marinan. Interestingly enough, what you didn't see there, it does not look like Ian sacrificed the Ashes Zealot to the Falcon Rath Aristocrats, so no counter there. But now we're wondering, did Ian draw that fifth land for that Zealous Conscripts? Because that is the Game Breaker card right now. We can't quite tell if he's drawn it or not, but he is waiting quite a little while, so it leads me to believe that he has not. So you see him thumbing through his hand. Yep, we see an Ash Zealot, a Knight of Infamy, a Hell Rider, and that Zealous Conscripts. That would probably, I think it would outright win the game for him right now, but it's not there. Okay. So now untap. Looks like he's got Ash Zealot, Zealous Conscripts. Uh, is that ultimate price there? That's a Knight of Infamy. Knight of in Infamy, hand. thank you. Three humans. and see where he's going. Knight of Infamy comes down. Well, it looks like, it looks like Ian might be in defense mode right now. Knight of Infamy, pass. Knight of Infamy by itself can hold off the smiter on the ground. But there's a lot of danger still here. And now we see a very, very good draw for Michael this turn as he sets down a Kessig Wolf run. Pushing through damage may have been difficult beforehand with, you know, the, in the indestructibility from the Falconrath Aristocrats attempting to trade with the Angels and other such nonsense with First Strike and Pro White and everything else that these creatures can do. But none of that really is going to end up mattering right now because of the Kessig Wolf run. Assuming that we're going to see an activation, and it looks like we do. And what we see is Ian scooping up his cards yep. and moving along to game three. One of the things to look at all of the one toughness that Ian Kendall had out there on the table. Aristocrat or Aristocrat, Knight, all of those one toughness cards. Not helpful when the trample comes on through. So Michael Manor, excuse me. Moranahan winning game two, going to be seeing game three here, which important for Ian, and this is part of the reason that having higher standings matters now, is that he's going to be playing first in this crucial game three, which is where his deck would like to be. Absolutely. Now remember, when uh, these two kinds of decks face off against each other, we saw exactly what was turning things around for Michael there. The Thrag Tusk took him out of danger. Ian Kendall stuck on four mana, not able to get that Zealous Conscript, which could have been a kill for him right there. But really, we do get to that point where that mid-game is reached and cards like Zealous Conscripts end up coming into it. Many other decks can't necessarily resist to the same degree as a deck like this, which runs Centaur Healer, runs Huntmaster of the Fells, and runs Thrag Tusk, not to mention Restoration Angel, just as a big, flashy body that can regain more life for you. So Michael is taking a quick break to the restroom, so we will have a slight delay here as Ian is going through his sideboard right now, looking over Michael's sideboard as well. Just really considering his options for this incredibly crucial game three for his red-black aggro deck. Again, being on this play this game is incredibly crucial. And one of the other things that's going to be super important in this game is if Michael does have an Avacyn's Pilgrim. It's the way for him to keep up on the draw against Ian's hyper-aggressive red-black aggro deck. Now, uh, in the quarterfinal three versus six, we have uh, results in Matt Fierick with the Blue-White Humans 
is now matched up against Ban Agra 1 to 1 by Ken Yokota. The winner of that game, game 3, will move on to tomorrow morning for our semifinals. Similarly, right here in front of us, Ian Kendall and Michael Marinan, when he returns uh, from a short break, will be playing their game three to continue on tomorrow in our semifinals. Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you see Ian kind of looking over things here. He has, you know, opted to look over his sideboard again. I'm just kind of wondering what's going through his mind right now as he's resetting his life pad about just, you know, did I sideboard correctly? Do I sideboard differently when I'm on the play and I'm on the draw? And a new challenger has entered the battlefield in Riki Hayashi. <laughs> wow. Now, uh, if you aren't familiar with Riki Hayashi, he only recently uh, acquired this beard of evil. So it used to be that there was nice guy Riki. Now it's evil side Riki. Extending the hand. <laughs> Ian <laughs> takes another victim down. Riki can't battle. Uh, he tried very hard, though. He tried very hard. But it is going to be interesting, uh, as I was speaking about, just seeing if, if he does to choose to change anything since he is on the play this game. You know, he does still have, you know, the ultimate prices, and I, I believe that those else concepts are going to be in. Maybe Flames of the Firebrand is a card that's better on the play than on the draw. The same can be said about Appetite for Brains, where you want to play a couple of guys, and then before Michael's able to hit his fourth mana, Appetite for Brains, I and mean, take that Restoration Angel that's been problematic, or take that Huntmaster of the Fells. Those cards do seem a little bit better on the play than on the draw. What are the, um, if you were in Ian Kendall's shoes, are there particular cards that you would definitely be wanting in or out? Um, I, I definitely think that Zell's Conscripts are going to always be good. I yeah. mean, we just saw that particular game, and this was the, that was a game where Ian was on the draw, where if he had ever drawn the fifth land for Zell's Conscripts, I think he wins immediately. Yeah. So that one would have been huge. I do like Appetite, of, Appetite for Brains much more on the play than on the draw. Um, Flames of the Firebrand is okay. I mean, we did see a Loxon on Smiter be played by Michael, and when that card's in the deck, you know, Flames of the Firebrand isn't very appealing, and we haven't even, he hasn't seen a center healer yet, but you can assume that that is going to yeah. be in Michael's deck. So those are the cards that really do stick out to me. Ultimate Price does not seem very exciting. Yeah, I agree with you on Ultimate Price. And actually, the seeing that Smiter, um, and seeing the way that the game kind of turned into a certain style of, uh, you know, push and pull race, the Vampire Nighthawks look a little more appealing to me. They can serve the job of killing a smiter should Michael Marinan be on the offense. They can take out a angel, like a restoration angel, in combat if they get into a fair fight. Um, I actually think that after sideboard, the Vampire Nighthawks from Ian Kendall might be reasonable. I don't think he can count on being able to be, I'm the super fast deck. I think he's got to think about how can he last. It's, it's really hard to say, honestly, because I think that the longer the game goes, the more that it favors that more that it favors Michael, just because of cards like Thragtus, oh, because yeah. of cards like Angel of Serenity, and his cards are designed to prolong the game. So, I think that you know trying to last longer might be something you know to look forward to on the draw, where he's trying to do that trading where Michael is naturally going to be the aggressor. But on the play, myself personally, I think I would. If, if he had the Nighthawks in, I would board them back out for even something as yeah. marginal as Rakdos Cackler and really just try to push my opponent over before they can ever get set up. Yeah, I mean, I still like the Cackler. Um, I think one of the things that is the struggle of the red-based aggro decks in these situations, when you're dealing with an Aya mid-range deck like this, there are simply so many bodies that can get in the way and make it very hard to be the deck that you want to be. And you might be kind of a bad more close to mid-range aggro list, but I'm not sure if you can succeed in being the red-black aggro dust list unless you hope your opponent gets really unlucky. And then you're going to get rewarded very highly for staying on that low element of the curve, but I think it's a really hard call. That's one that uh, I, a lot of players in the current amazingly life gain heavy metagame that's available often have to struggle with in figuring out what answer they want to go with. And as we see these two players shuffling here, while Ian was, was side shuffling, I did see a Flames of the Fire brand um, in his deck. So he has boarded in at least one copy of those. Unsure if he's boarded in the second one, but that is something that could possibly happen in this particular game. As we see both players fanning out their seven cards, looking for some solid seven card hands for this final game of our quarterfinals match between Ian Kendall and Michael and his Naya mid-range deck. Ian Kendall says, I'll keep. Michael Marinan agrees, and we start out 
Dragon Skull Summit, the opener for Ian Kendall. No one drop here for Ian, and, and Michael has his best one drop in Avacyn's Pilgrim. So for Ian, I think it's very important for him to be able to deal with this, and he is able to Pillar. with Pillar of Flame. So he's able to keep Michael's development down a little bit while also trying to attack his mana by taking off that white source. That and hand. We, oh, sorry. we do see a mountain here, and there's also a Cast of Wolf Run. And looking at that hand, Adrian, I do not see a white mana. I see three one drops going to hit the table right now. Cackle, cackle, or is it cackle, vamp, vamp? Boom. Here they come. All right, and, and there they are. So the pressure is going to be turned on pretty quick here. Oh. oh. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle. Wow. Red, white, and green. Oh, oh man. Bonfire boy. of the damned. It never gets old, as we see an Ash Zealot here. Cackler and Zealot are going to get in for four points of damage. But what a backbreaking Bonfire of the damned that was. What could have been for Ian Kendall. He is still trying to develop with a second Rakdos Cackler. Is there another Bonfire of the damned? There's not. And there there's... is not Adrian White mana. Yeah, and there's a stumble on any mana. Oh, this is what you want to have happen, that stumble. Does he have the fourth land? Oh, and kills my the blood crypts. lord. And Boom. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Ten damage coming on over. And just that quickly. That's exactly how fast this Black Rat Boom. can be. And that's it. That's it. Even though Michael was able to peel an awesome bonfire, Ian Steck didn't let him down, just still knocked him over. And that's the power of these decks. That's why I think... When you're playing this deck, like, you just have to try to run him over as fast as you can. And killing Avacyn's Pilgrim that game, and we saw it in previous games as well, super important to be able to stop this deck from really being able to operate. Michael never drawing the white mana, never being able to cast Centaur Healer, Restoration Angel, and in the end, getting roasted and toasted by, yeah. the, by those red-black beats. Yeah. yeah, totally. Now, Ian is not the only winner. We've got at least one more winner out there. And that winner is the winner of the first Star City Games premium giveaway that we have been, uh, that we're going to be doing this weekend. Every top eight of a Star City Games open series event, whether it's the standard open, the legacy open, the invitational itself, we give stuff away. We do. Three months for our quarterfinal winner of the premium giveaway. Answer the trivia question with that hashtag SCG premium. Get it right. Amongst all of those correct answers, one lucky individual will get three free months of premium. Your question, Cedric, was? My question was, in Ian Kendall's deck list, in which he's able to move on to the semifinals for tomorrow, he is playing a three-drop that has not seen a lot of playing constructed of late. We have seen different three-drops for Red Black or Black Red Agrodex. We have seen Pyroheart Wolf. We have seen Rakdos Kirun. And Ian Kendall's deck, we are seeing Hellhole Flailer. And Thomas Darlington at TMOS81, I know you. You are a winner, my friend. <laughs> you win three months of premium. Congratulations to you, TMOS81. At Twitter, hopefully you're following at SCG Live so we can get a hold of you. But congratulations once again on three months of premium. Yeah. Now, if you are not following, make sure you get that follow going on to at SCG Live so you can get that prize. Absolutely. The other match we have in progress, you can see our two competitors, Ken Yakoda, running a Bant aggro list and Matt Fierick with blue white humans wing crafter and Geist of St. Traft are blue cards in the main deck. Now Kenny Yakoda's deck list is a little bit a little bit interesting here um, you know it's kind of like a Naya mid-range deck in, in a way but he has blue instead of red the blue of course being for Geist of St. Traft um, he also has a detention sphere in the main deck and some sideboard options but this green white deck that he has, or the green and white cards, excuse me, are just more traditional green and white cards. Avacyn's Pilgrim, Knight of Glory, Lots on Smiter, Restoration Angel, Silver Blade Paladin, Strangle Root Guys, Sublime Archangel, Thalia Guardian of Thraven, Celestia Charm, and Rancor. So these yeah. are cards that you guys are likely familiar with, and you can see them all littered all over the table yeah. there for Ken. I mean, look at that that in play on Ken Yakota's side. You can see the Geists and the Silver Blade Paladins. Now, Silverblade, Silverblade Paladin and Rancor is just such a potent way to attack your opponent. And Ken adding that Geist of St. Traft onto there, it's, it's really quite an interesting list. Make sure that you check out the text side coverage this whole weekend and uh, make sure you get a chance to look at lists like this. It's always a good idea. 
Is that a Gavany? A Riders of the Gavany? That is. That is a second Riders of the Gavany there for Matt Furek. <coughs> we will find out what the first one is naming. As you see, the first Riders of the Gavany paired with a Silverblade Paladin. You see the Wingcrafter soul bonded with a Geist of Saint Trap. And we're going to find out what this second Riders of Gavany is naming as well. The first one naming Angel, which is a good name for Restoration Angel, of course. The second one, either Human or Spirit for the Geist. So we'll see exactly what Matt is going to choose to do here. Kenya Coda looks like he's in trouble. Remember, this is game three, so they are sideboarded. Kenya Coda almost could wish, depending on what his hand was, that his life was five lower. There is a faith shield in his sideboard. And we see that the second Riders of Gavany is naming Spirit, which is going to make it so that the two Strangaroo Geist on defense can't block. But and also another interaction here is that the Moreland Haunt that Ken had hanging back to activate to make a Spirit also will not be blocking this turn. As we see Wing Crafter looking to turn sideways. Maybe a little Silver Blade Paladin action to go along with Riders of Gavany. We will see. If you're just joining us, I'm Adrian Sullivan here with Cedric Phillips. This is SCG Live. This whole weekend, we've been bringing you awesome coverage of the Invitational. We have two other major events here, the Standard Open, which you're watching the quarterfinal, quarterfinals of here. And tomorrow, we're going to wrap up this tournament with the semis. And in addition to the top eight of the Invitational, have an entire huge tournament, the Legacy Open here for Los Angeles. As we see on the end step, Ken does make a spirit token here with a Moreland Haunt. He did jump that Avacyn's Pilgrim in front, and now he is passing back. Draws his card for the turn as he was, looks to be at least empty-handed, and figuring out what he wants to do. This has been a long day for our competitors. They have been here for about 12 or 13 hours of magic. We see him reaching, and we see a Knight of Glory here from Ken. So a human is a good creature type to have him play because Riders of Gavany is naming Angel and Spirit. So those are some things that can jump in the way here, all, including the Silverlight Paladin as well. But the rest of the stuff out there really can't do anything, but it also can't attack very well either. Now, one of the things you might be wondering, if Riders of Gavany is on humans for Matt Fierick, why didn't that Geist come, I saw on Angels and Humans, why didn't, or Angels and Spirits, pardon me, why didn't that Geist come in? Well, the Geist is not a human, and so it is not protected by the Riders of Gavany. As so we see Matt draw Cavern of Souls for the turn to go along with one mystery card. Can't quite make out. But now we are getting kind of into a board stall where players are trying to figure out exactly how they're going to break through. As we see, both players are on 10 life as well. Both of us have amassed interesting board positions. It would, you know, first glance would make it seem like it's going to be easier for Michael to attack because his creatures do have protection. But as you said, Geist of St. Trapped is one of the few that cannot really get through very well here. And it's his, it's, excuse me, Matt's heaviest hitter. Cards that could potentially cause a breakthrough of this stall for Matt Fierick. He does have Rally the Peasants, and if you'll notice, there is red mana um, in his play, so he could flash it back. Now the question is, does he have it in his deck still? This is a sideboarded game, so he might not have it in his deck. And even if he has it, does he have enough to make the kill happen? Because a return strike from Ken, if Matt can't kill him, would certainly kill Matt. And now you're seeing Matt move around creatures for potential blocks right now. He's deciding, am I going to move in here? Am I going to go for this? You know, what, what am I afraid of? Is there anything that, can't, that can stop this from being a pretty poor attack as he's moving these permanents around quite a bit? And you do just see a Riders of Gavany that is paired with a, a Silver Blade Paladin get in there, threaten six points of damage, and Ken throws a Knight of Glory in front of it. A post-combat precinct captain is a human, so it is going to work in favor with both of those riders of Gavany, but again, we are still in a very similar position, but it looks like Matt has the advantage as he is whittling away yep. at Ken's non-angel, non-spirit creatures. Another spirit in the air with Moreland Haunt. Now, Matt Fierk, I mentioned he um, theoretically has a card like Rally the Peasants to break through. Also, cards that exist could be Divine Deflection or a Johnny Caller of the Pride. Ken has drawn his turn 
do see some cards moving around here. And we do see a Thalia Guardian of, Guardian of Thraben, another non-spirit, non-angel creature being important right now. Of course, it's not going to do a good job of winning the fight with this Riders of Gavany that is paired with Silverway Paladin, but it will get in the way. And I think right now what Ken's trying to do is buy himself time to find some of his better draws. When it comes to breaking through a stalemate, the cards Ken is looking for would be Call of the Conclave, if he hasn't sided it out, or potentially Faith's Shield, should his life total get down to five or less, so that the final hour element of Faith's Shield can come into play. If you're not sure what Faith's Shield is, this, uh, this little innocuous card only costs a single mana in order to protect any creature from, as you see there, any permanent, I should say, from a color, but at Faithful Hour, all of your permanents and you gain protection from that color. As we see Ken moving around some creatures here, setting up for the next turn from Matt. You know, this is th this situation, it's very important that each player does manage their resources incredibly well. One misstep could really lead to a disaster here, and both players are drawing incredibly live as far as options are concerned. As you see both players drawing their cards and really thinking through their turns and what they want to do, it's going to be interesting to see what Matt was able to draw for his turn. Rally the Peasants, a card that you don't see very often either. That plus two, plus oh instant with flashback for red. Matt has found a way to slide four copies of those into his deck, and I'm sure not many players have played around that this weekend. One of the things I would have to say is, uh, having played a lot of Standard lately, I would not have expected Rally the Peasants at any point in any of the matches I've played in recent memory. And so now we do see a precinct captain jumping on in here. Looks like we may have a Thalia Garden of Thraben deciding to jump in the way, but as Ken decides exactly what he wants to do on this attack phase, we do have an update that Justin Wynn was victorious 2-0. And who was he able to win over, Adrian? That's Corey Burkhart with the uh, Nightshade Peddler combo deck that we saw. Well, not a combo deck in the sense that it goes off, but it has the Nightshade Peddler Is It Static Caster combo in it. And that's the only 2-0 victory. Everyone else has gone to a third game. I know that Corey Burkhardt, I believe, was the number one seed walking to the top of this tournament. So a very good tournament for him, but comes to an end at the hands of Justin Wynn in two games. And Justin will be back here tomorrow to play at the semifinals and battle on for the trophy and the title of Star City Games Open Los Angeles champion. As we do see a ranker here off the top for Ken. Ken looking at uh, the board situation, trying to see what is a safe attack. And you see Ken taking a look at Riders of Gavany again, trying to figure out exactly how he can go about getting through this problem. If you're just joining us, I'm Adrian Sullivan here in the booth with Cedric Phillips. Only two matches remain right now in uh, this quarterfinal. We watched one of those matches, Ian Kendall defeating Michael Marin yeah, Marinan, um, Red Black versus Nye Midrange. The other match that has uh, completed, Justin Nguyen defeating Corey Burkhart, that's Blue White Red Flash over the Peddler deck. Now, of the two matches that remain, Ken Yakota and Matt Fierick furiously trying to find some kind of edge in this stalemate. Ken, to me, um, looks like he's a slight underdog, but it's still a really good fight for both of these players. As we do see a Restoration Angel with a Rancor coming in, I believe that Restoration Angel is paired with this Silverblade Paladin. So this attack is for 10 damage. This is a very, very strong attack here from Ken. Looks to be a lethal one. Now, Wingcrafter can jump in the way. So can Geist the St. Trapped as those two are paired up. Best friends forever. War Falcon also can jump in the way if that little birdie wants to. But we are going to see a Wingcrafter, it looks like, jump in the way here. Wingcrafter being a human, working out favorably with Riders of Gavany. But Matt was trying to think about, does he have a trick? Does he not have a trick? Maybe he has something like a Selesnya charm. 
which would be a complete disaster for me, but it doesn't look to be the case, as it looks like Matt has moved down to one. Now we're at the position where Matt, under a huge amount of pressure, is going to need to end the game this turn or draw in his uh, sideboard, if he doesn't end it, a divine deflection that's sufficient to kill Kenya Koda. That would require him to get Ken down low enough that divine deflection will prevent Matt from dying and be enough to kill Matt. Could be a hard call or a hard pull. That's. And now we see Matt setting a potential blocks here, and I like this. I like the fact that he is laying everything out. Wants to see what is going to happen. What is worst possible situ uh, Excuse me, worst possible scenario for him. What is the second worst possible scenario? How much damage can I get through? When the game is basically over on the next turn format, it's nice to see him lay out everything, see the potential, you know, see what's the worst that can happen. It does give a tip off to Ken about what his blocks are supposed to be, but at the same time, it could be Matt leading Ken into a trap with what his blocks are quote-unquote supposed to be. So I like when I see players do this. I, I have adopted this uh, from Rich Hohen is someone that I saw nice. doing this in Limited the, Magic. The Canadian master. He's Canadian, yes? He is. Yeah. I have not seen him in a long time. They come and they go, unfortunately. Matt, Ferrick, and Kenya Koda. These are the final moments of this match. There's not going to be many more turns uh, for this game. He's got his imaginary angel over there. What happens if this Geist of St. Traff comes in? All of these little 1-1 one -one spirits, what are they going to do? You see him sliding cards around here, putting creatures in front of the spirits, putting the spirit in front of the Geist of St. Traff because it is soul-bounded with a wing crafter, so a flyer would have to get in front of that. You see War Falcon being placed in front of a spirit token. You see these Riders of Gavany and these other such creatures. You know, they're going to be difficult creatures to block because of Riders of Gavany naming spirit and naming, excuse me, Angel. Now, these matches are untimed. You can see the clock timing up. That's how long this round has been going. Matt Ferrick here mulling over the options one of the things while these are untimed there might come a moment where the judge might say you're going to have to make a decision it doesn't matter if the board is complicated now uh, some players I know uh, Kai Booty for example definitely uh, made fun of that element at Pro Tour recently or not made fun of was maybe uh, scornful of it but it is something we want to get the tournament going and keep it going we see the attack now. All kinds of stuff coming on in. It looks like he's turning them all sideways, and this may be a situation of where if Ken has a trick, the game ends, and Matt is just hoping that he doesn't have one. But I think we see every single creature here attacking for Ken and hoping that this is enough to push through. As this board state is rather complicated, we see Silverblade Paladins getting in front of each other. We see Thalia Garden of Thraven jumping in front of a Riders of Gavany. You see all of these blocks laid out here. Is it enough to push through the eight damage. You see Ken going, I think Ken is counting six points of damage here, I believe he's counting. We see the three creatures that are getting through are Riders of Gavany, a Precinct Captain, and a Wing Crafter is what it looks like is coming through here. Now we see a bunch of creatures. We see a huge wow. trade-off here. We see a guys. We see a stranger root guys come back with a counter. We see a bunch of spirits leaving play. We see some humans leaving play. Double striking silver blade paladins leaving play. Look at this cleanup. That board just clearing, clearing, clearing. Thalia Guardian of Thraven leaving play. You see Riders of Gavany is living. With Vigilance, you see a Geist of Saint Trap. But the one thing and the key here, the thing that you do still see in play, Adrian, is a Restoration Angel with a Rancor on it on Ken's side of the battlefield. Now I believe uh, we're going to see... Did that Precinct Captain uh, get through? I don't know that it did. Uh, that Precinct Captain looked like it did get through, and I think that he did miss the trigger on the Precinct Captain to make that 1-1 one -one Soldier token. 
which, uh, and now we have another match result elsewhere. Corey Paxton beats Sam Kikes. That's Human Reanimator over four color mid range. This is the only game still continuing. As we see, Matt was going to lay a Cavern of Souls here. He opts not to. And reconsider the decision. Now we see the Cavern of Souls. We will get the name on that in just a moment. But our life totals are updated. It is one for Matt Ferrick. It is two for Ken Yakota. And Matt's attack stuff is already over. So that card that you brought up earlier, Adrian, Divine Deflection and Faith Shield, does he have either one of those? As we see a spirit token made end of turn here. Matt Ferrick, what you got? We wait to see. It's worth noting a divine deflection could have been used during combat in order to win. Yep. We see Silver Blade Paladin drawn here for Ken. Ken arranging his lands, deciding if he wants to play that. Do I want to leave Moreland Haunt up? What's my plan of action this turn? But we do see him tapping three mana, one of which is a Cavern of Souls. Looks like we are going to see that Silver Blade Paladin come down now. Best friends with? Looks to be that spirit token. And Ken is kind of just going, uh, like, are, are you dead? Like, I'm pretty sure you're dead. And, and that's it. Sits. That is it. Ken Yakota. Oh, boy. He ends up winning at, at, he ends up winning at what the life totals are at. Two to one. 